winding down these days, so maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for a quiz. I don't usually do that in this class, but we're down to one, two, four, five, six, seven. Seven out of twenty people. Yeah. All right. So if we're at the same level Friday, there will be a quiz first thing. Get on your phones. Tell your friends. All right. In fact, if we're below 50 percent, there will be a quiz. Or don't tell your friends. Either way. Maybe they're not your friends. <laughs> um, any questions about Lab 4? The Altera monitor uh, system should be installed on the machines now. It was installed over the weekend. It should find the Altera monitor depends upon having Quartus installed and having the NIOS IDE installed to find all the libraries it needs. It finds the libraries by looking for a, a Windows environment variable called Quartus underscore root dir, all uppercase. And this should also have been set up. We tested it on a couple of machines and it worked. However, if it doesn't work, let me know. And you can fix this by just putting in the Quartus root directory. If you Google this up, you'll find out what the value should be. <coughs> I might have even put it in the lab also, the lab write up. I suggest you use the Altera monitor and not use the NIOS IDE. Has anybody tried either one of them yet? Okay. Any other questions about, I know it's early yet, lab four. Questions about final project. So what I thought we could talk about then is um, simplified fo floating point. It's a topic that some people have used in the past in final projects, for instance, with a uh, 3D rendering system. And some people have used it for digital filtering. Floating point has obvious advantages in that it's easier to figure out how the system works. Um, it has disadvantages in that it requires more hardware resource than fixed point arithmetic. Um, and the, the standard IEEE floating point, is this a topic of study these days? IEEE floating point formats. No, that's, you're not. You know what those are. Just all right. So, IEEE floating point format is 24-bit Mantissa. Although, since these aren't really logarithms, it really should be called a significand. except nobody uses that phrase. It's 24 bits of, of fractional value and 8-bit exponent. This is offset binary. So a value 
of in IEEE a value of of seven uh, F. It's eight bits, so a value of zero X seven F represents two to the zero. 0x8o represents 2 to the 1. 0x7e is 2 to the minus 1, and so on. And the significant is arranged so that the high order bit, the high order bit is always 1, representing a fraction greater than or equal to greater than or equal to 0 0.5. So the binary point is put here. However, since the high order bit is always 1, it is not stored. So this is an implicit 1, and what's actually stored are the 23 bits after the implicit 1. So <clears throat> there's 8 bits of exponent, 23 bits of significant, of mantissa that are actually stored for a full 24-bit mantissa, and then that leaves one bit out of a 32-bit word for the sign bit, S-I-G-N. So this is not two's, the system is not two's complement. It is sign magnitude. I triple E floating point is sign magnitude. with a bunch of extensions. For instance, there is a bit pattern, and I don't remember what it is, there's a bit matter pattern that sig signifies that the actual value is plus infinity. Not just a big number, but infinite. There is a bit pattern, a reserve bit pattern for negative infinity. There is a reserve bit pattern for, we don't know what this is, but it's not a number. So there's a NAN indication. And for very small numbers, for very small numbers, you're allowed to not have the high order bit be a 1. And the 1 then appears someplace at a, at a, least, a less significant position. And a number where the high, high, the high bit is not 1 is called a denorm or denormalized number. And those all have to, uh, plus infinity, minus infinity, nan, and denorm all have to be handled in a very specific IEEE specified fashion. The result is that you have a, by the way, this is only single precision. There's also a double precision version, which has a 56-bit mantissa. The effect is then that you have a rather accurate, <clears throat> rather flexible, error-resistant number system that is so nice to use. Because it either works or it tells you it's not going to. But it's expensive to build in hardware because it requires 24-bit multipliers. It requires, for, for multiplication, actually, floating points easier than add. For adders, it requires wide shifters because you have to be able to shift one of the smaller of the two inputs by up to 23 bits before you do the add. So it requires hierarchical shifters, usually. And it requires lots of special logic to handle denorms and infinities and, and so on. So if you instantiate uh, an IEEE floating point multiplier on the FPGA, <coughs> excuse me, and there is intellectual property for that, you can, in, if you go to the um, Mega Manager or the Mega Wizard or whatever they call it these days, and uh, pop up the menu list, 
there's a multiplier, floating point multiplier available. You just drag it out and hook it up. And it takes about uh, 2,000 blocks and about half the multipliers on the chip. So you can build a couple of floating point multipliers on the chip, maybe four uh, max. And uh, so it's a little bulky on this particular FPGA. Now, there's much bigger FPGAs where it's not such a problem. But on, our, on the FPGA we're using, it's a little bit bulky. So question is, how can you simplify this, this very nice, robust system to something simpler, which is still useful, but has a smaller hardware footprint, at the same time, allowing you to use the kind of high-level floating point thinking that you're used to doing in, in, say, MATLAB. And there's a couple of different approaches, both of which are documented uh, on, the, on the 5760 site. I built a minimum system because I wanted to see if I could build very small multipliers that were appropriate for digital signal processing. There's been a bunch of experimental work in uh, signal compression to, the, to suggest that if you're doing MPEG-like compression of images, you, floating point is handy but you don't get much extra signal to noise ratio if you go above nine bits of mantissa. Hmm. And there are some other DSP results that suggest that some place between eight bits and eleven bits is kind of a nice uh, level for the mantissa accuracy as long as you have a reasonable exponent range. It doesn't have to be huge exponent range, but a reasonable exponent range. Yeah, IEEE exponent 8-bit. So it goes from 2 to the 2 to the 127, 2 to the 127 to 2 to the minus 127. Divide that by 3, you get about, yeah, it's about, uh, 38 or 39 or something. So you get about 10 to the 38th dynamic range in IEEE. That's a lot. That's probably more than you need for most digital filtering. So I implemented an 8-bit version, 9-bit version actually, because uh, because the multipliers are 9 bits, and because 9 bits is ab about the minimum that you can use for DSP. Uh, Schuyler Schneider last year implemented 18-bit floating point for Lab 4, because he, did, he wanted to do the Mandelbrot set and floating point. And both those systems are documented uh, on the 5760 site, but I'll talk about the 9-bit version today. In the end, my 9-bit multiplier ran at 50 megahertz. It's a combinatorial multiplier. It's not a pipeline multiplier. It's, it's a one-cycle multiplier, and it runs at uh, about 50 megahertz. And the adder, <coughs> which is more complicated to implement, uh, runs at about uh, uh, 32 megahertz single cycle. I didn't pipeline it. Schuyler pipelined his adder to make it a two cycle adder. So the scheme I used was designed so that an 18-bit word was a good fit for, for the floating point format. And the format of the floating point in sort of uh, Verilog-like notation 
is uh, exponent 7 down to 0. And then the mantissa, 8 down to 0. I want to make this really simple and really fast. So, I did not, there are no nans, not numbers, no infinities, no d norms, which means that the high order bit of the mantissa, the high order bit is always one. unless the value is zero, unless the value is truly zero, exactly zero. So this underflows ungracefully. It underflows suddenly and without warning. In fact, since it's a real time, it's sort of designed to be, it's designed to be a real time system, there are no warnings of any kind. It never throws an exception. What would it throw an exception to? There's no operating system. So, you have to be careful not to overflow or underflow the multiplier. Because these are 9 bit mantises, we only need one 9 by 9 multiplier to implement it, which means we can put up to 70 floating point multipliers on the chip. And the multiplier, so the multiplier took one 9 by 9 multiplier and 60, only 60 logic blocks, logic elements. And the adder takes uh, 200 logic elements. So you can put a lot of floating point logic on, on, the, on the chip if you're willing to restrict yourself to nine bits. I chose to make two to the zero B zero X eight zero rather than 7F. And why did I do that? It's because I didn't read the IEEE specification carefully first. But my specification is that 2 to the 0 exponent is 128. So 2 to the 2 would be uh, uh, 130. And the 9-bit fraction, the mantissa, has to be in the range of 0 to 1 minus 2 to the minus 9. But, but if it is not 0, a non-zero has to be in the range of 0 0.5 to 1 to 2 to the minus 9. So the, the only range that's allowable for a non-zero value is 0 0.5 to 1 minus 2 to the minus 9. So how do we encode this? So 0 0.5 then the sine bit is 0, 0 hex H80 is the exponent. Mantissa, and now the mantissa would be 0 H100. So 
<coughs> a value of 0.5 says, set the mantissa equal to 0.5 exactly, and then multiply it by 1, 2 to the 0. Right. So minus 0.5 is easy. You just change the sign bit and leave everything else the same. Two point zero is going to be four times as big as a half, so that better be an eighty two hex zero H one zero zero. So the exponent goes up by two, two powers of two. The mantissa doesn't change, of course. And 10.0 becomes 0 sine 0 hex 8 4 0 hex 1 4 0. Hmm. So this is, must be, if this is 2 to the 0, this must be 2 to the 4, so that must be 16. Well, uh, the exponent is 16. 16 times a half <coughs> is 8. And let's see. So this is a 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So this is 1 half. This is 1 quarter, this is one eighth. So we have one half times sixteen plus one eighth times sixteen equals ten. That's a good thing. And going the other direction, zero point one would be sine zero zero hex seven D and 0 hex 199 approximately. So it's an 18-bit representation. It's about as minimal as you could possibly get. If we were to add one bit, more to the mantissa, it would require using an 18-bit multiplier. At that point, you may as well go to 18 bits for the mantissa, which is what Schuyler did. Oh, I forgot to tell you, there's also no rounding in my system. It just truncates, it's brutally truncates. And to do DSP, there were, I had to implement five floating operations. Add, multiply, negate, which is embarrassingly easy, of course, because you just flip one sign bit. And int to float, and float to int. That's because the codecs on the chip are, work in integer format. And I wanted to be able to take audio data in, slurp it into floating point format, do DSP on it, and then put it back out through the audio codec, for instance, or video codec. So int to float and float to int were both necessary. Since it's a 9-bit format, it's not necessary to do 16-bit integers. In fact, I only bothered to do 10-bit, which gave one extra bit um, of precision compared to the 9-bit floating point representation. So it's good enough. It's as good as you can do with this floating point. However, the one, one limitation on this is that if you implement this set of 
of operations with 9-bit floating point, you have to be very careful about how you design your filters. You have to use a form which is tolerant of low precision. And so the examples that I produced uh, had to be carefully balanced, in fact, using what's called a second order section, uh, which I'll talk about more. Any questions on this? So the multiply algorithm is, is very easy. Although it turns out that when you start to implement something like this, you realize you don't actually understand it until you write the code. Because there's lots of ugly little details that come in. But if either input is 0, if, it, if the high order bit of the mantissa If either input is 0, I'll put 0. If that's not true, then the output is exp1 plus exp2, exponents add when you multiply, minus 128, or perhaps 129. And I'll tell you why that is in a moment. <coughs> why? Because remember that we're using 120, uh, we're using 128 offset. We're using hex 80 offset numbers. And so when you add two numbers that are both offset by 128, you now have an offset of 256. So we have to subtract off 128 to get back to the same format, which is offset by 128. So the next step then is to do the raw multiply of uh, mantissa 1 times mantissa 2 and the range remember that the that the range of the mantissa is 0 0.5 to 1 minus 2 to the minus 9 so the minimum product is 0 0.25 has got to be less than or equal to the product which has got to be less than or equal to 1 minus a little bit. If the product has the high order bit set, if the product has the high order bit set, then the product must have been greater than uh, uh, 0.5, greater than or equal to 0.5. And the output, if product high bit is set, then you take the high bit, eight, uh, high nine bits, product as, and put them in the mantissa, and the exponent gets exp1 plus exp2 minus 128. If, if the, if high bit is 0, then the product was less than 0.5, which means to normalize it, we have to shift the mantissa left by 1, which is a multiply by 2, which means we have to decrease the exponent by 1. So we 
So we take the So we take the top nine bits of product, product shifted by one, and we set exponent to exponent one plus exponent two minus one twenty eight minus one. So one twenty nine. So we do a multiply by 2, and we do a divide by 2. So it's the same number. And the output is normalized. Oh, and the sign is just the XOR of the two signs. So is something missing here? What happens if EXP1 plus EXP2 is less than 128? Uh-oh. It's an underflow, right? Because remember, these are offset. These are both offset by 128. If the sum of them is less than 20, 128, it means that the actual value of exponent 1 plus exponent 2 must be less than 2 to the minus 127. And so we've underflowed. And so if this is the case, you should set the output to exactly 0. This is an underflow and has to set output to zero. The system does not detect overflow. Underflows can clearly happen, but overflows you just better not have. And you can see this is pretty fast to implement because really it's a it's a integer product which either takes one shift or no shifts and you have to do a couple of, of simple comparisons to find out if there's been an underflow or an overflow. So it's really a very simple system to do. Add is much uglier. Any questions? The reason that add is uglier is that you have to, before you can add two numbers, their exponents have to be equal. Before you can add two mantises, their exponents have to be equal. So you may have to shift one of the two inputs up to 9 bits. If you shift it more than 9 bits, you don't bother to do the add. You just output the bigger of the two numbers. Because the other one, because the smaller one is insignificant. So you have to do an initial shift of an input of up to 9 bits. And then the output can be anywhere from 0 to 2. If it's greater than 1, it's easy to fix. You just shift 1 to the right. If it's less than 0.5, it can be as small as 0. You have to do at least 9 shifts to find out if you can normalize it. If you can't normalize it, it's underflowed. If you can normalize it, then you have to fix the exponent by the, to match the number of shifts you had to do to normalize it. So it's, it's really harder.
So what you have to do is, first of all, if both are zero, both inputs are zero, then I'll put a zero. That's easy. Two. Determine which is bigger. Determine which input is smaller and shift it to IFT. <laughs> yeah, nice. And shift it up to nine bits to make exponents equal. If it's greater than nine bits, just output the larger input. If the signs of the input are the same, are the same, don't care whether they're both positive or both negative. If the signs are the same, then you have to add the mantises. If the signs are different, you have to subtract the mantises. So if the signs are the same, Add the bigger and shifted smaller, and the output has to be between 0 0.5 and some and 2.0. So if the sum is bigger than 1, we shift 1 to the right. We shift the mantissa 1 to the right, which is a divide by 2. So we increment the exponent and output it. And the sign is now the sign of either input. It doesn't matter because they have the same sign. If the signs are different, to subtract bigger minus smaller which means that the result of the subtraction will always be positive And the result will be 0 less than difference less than 0 0.5. Now we have to shift up to 9 bits to set I bit mantissa
and the sine is the sine of the bigger. input. <coughs> so there's two different shifters that have to go on here. There's a pre-shift where you normalize the exponents and then if you're ending up with different signs there's a post-shift where you normalize the mantis at the end. For 9-bit mantises this is not so bad because a 9-bit brute force shifter is not very big. If you start going to 24-bit mantissa, now you need a really big shifter, which means it's going to be slow. Or you get a little smarter and you don't shift by ones, but you have a two-stage shifter in which the first stage is a shift by four, by a multiple of four, and the second stage is a shift by zero to three, by ones. But this was narrow. This my 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 uh, uh, format was narrow enough that it didn't take a particularly long time to uh, to do all the shifts. So like I said it ran in about 30 megahertz or 32 megahertz uh, without pipelining. If I pipelined it, it would run. If I pipelined it between this shift and this shift, it would run somewhat faster. questions on this. It's been used on a couple of final projects. I'm reasonably certain that it's mostly correct. At least I couldn't see any artifacts attributable to to gross bungles. I could see some artifacts due to round off problems or truncation problems using this short format. But seems to be pretty stable. How many people can use floating point for lab four? Thought about implementation at all yet? Time's a wasting folks. One week's almost gone. Lab four. It's gonna take you a week to get the NIOS two running. So let's see, how many actual real operations do you have to do for, for lab four? So each iteration is Zn plus one is equal to Zn squared plus C, where these are all complex numbers. So we have to do a complex multiply and a complex add. So a complex multiply, assuming that you're storing the, assuming that you're storing complex numbers as a plus b i, and not in, not in um, magnitude phase angle, then the multiply here, this is going to be what? Uh, a squared plus 2ba is the real part, right? No. a squared minus b squared, and then the imaginary part is i times 2ab, right? So a multiply, a multiply, a shift, a multiply, and two adds. So it's three multiplies and two adds plus another add. I'm sorry, two, one add. So it's two, add, two multiplies, three multiplies and two adds. 
So you could do that. You could do that in floating point without having too much floating point arithmetic. But remember, to get good speed out of this, you're going to have to build a bunch of iterators. Last year, the best performer had 13 iterators. So they could fit 13 iteration units on the FPGA. Each one of which was taking a different C and doing this calculation over and over again. So there's going to be some trade-off between having a really fast iterator and having a lot of them, which probably means having a trade-off between bits, number of bits in fixed point or floating point, and number of iterators. But you need to start thinking about it. Any questions? All right, so I can be in lab tomorrow afternoon in a little bit. I'm the, the, uh, the ECE 1810 lab is canceled for this week because they're, they have a different schedule this week. So tomorrow afternoon is relatively open for a change. But I think, as I said before break, a reasonable, a reasonable first uh, deadline would be to have a, a, a NIOS 2 program executing serial by Friday. I think that that's, that's where you should be by this Friday. Then after that, you can worry about the parallel iterators. Oh, for lab, for lab three. Um, so one, one, of the, one of the pieces of lab three is to feed the drum back into MATLAB and uh, then uh, Fourier transform it and look at the spectrum. You can use a raw FFT. You can, there's various ways of getting the sound back into MATLAB. And there's various ways of taking a, a spectrum in MATLAB. Getting the, the drum back into MATLAB requires an audio connection, obviously, to the computer. You could use, um, you could do it as a two-step process. You could use the Windows sound recorder thing. I don't even know what it's called anymore, sound recorder and then take that from a WMA file to WAVE, W-A-V file, and get it into MATLAB somehow. Or you can record directly to MATLAB in at least two different ways, and some of you probably know other ways. There is a function called WAVE record. Do any of you use that? WAVE record. There's another one called audio recorder. Wave record is kind of old and crufty, but simple. Audio recorder is very flexible and modern, but has lots of options. Both of them end up producing an array, which is big, but who cares? You've got lots of memory. Um, if you wanted to save these to disk or to email them to me, you could use WAV write, wave write, to output them as WAV files to disk. On the other end, if you want to FFT them, there's an FFT command which produces a really ugly spectrum because it does no averaging. And as you probably know, you get one spectral estimate out for every sample in, and so the noise on your sample dominates the noise on the FFT. 
but there is a, another function called P Welsh, W E L C H, P Welsh, which breaks the spec, breaks the sound up into eight parts by default and averages the eight spectra together for you and then plots them on a nice scale. So that it keeps the noise down and controls the windowing a little better than FFT, which applies no windowing at all. B. Welch windows, it averages, and it plots on a reasonable scale by default, plots on log scales by default. You might want to use that to get a spectrum out. Don't wait to Friday to do that. It's due at the beginning of Lab Friday. Okay?